Uh, I do have a long name, but people just call me Bill. But that is absolutely sufficient. Uh, and uh, today, myself and Fabrice uh, will be talking about mighty metals, but actually I think you'll find that the two topics are pretty different, but then you will hopefully see the applications of metals in, of course, very different areas, very different uh, uh, application spheres. And what I will talk about today is how the research that we do uh, uh, can help speed up the drug discovery and development process within an industrial setting. So as an overview, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what a typical drug or a medicine is. Uh, I will introduce to you the, the, the origins or the, the process of where the contemporary, the modern medications that we take today come from, how it all comes about. Uh, I'll then move on to tell you more about how organic chemistry or synthetic chemistry specifically can help facilitate this process, make it faster. And finally, and I'll touch a little bit uh, uh, on our research on palladium catalysis and how we can make new molecules in new ways. So this is a good picture, good description, uh, I think, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what we do these days to treat the various uh, illnesses that we have. And admittedly, many of us uh, take a lot of tablets, some more, some less, but the, the, the fact of life is that we actually have a lot of medication, uh, a lot of types of medication that we can take uh, to make our lives healthier. Uh, and the question I like to ask is, have you, have you ever wondered what isn't that little tablet that you take? So as an example, uh, I've chosen Lipitor. I don't know how many of you would know what, what Lipitor is. It is, in fact, the best-selling drug of all time. It is a blockbuster drug. So Lipitor is a cholesterol-lowering medication. It's a so-called statin, and that's quite a big problem, of course, nowadays uh, uh, in light of the increasing levels of obesity uh, globally, I would say. But again, this is still more of a, of a first world type, uh, type problem. But you can see how many people would be interested in taking this drug. Uh, it used to be marketed by Pfizer, uh, and we used to have also a, a, a rather large Pfizer research facility down in Kent and Sandwich. Unfortunately, they have moved out, and that's been quite a big blow to the UK uh, economy. But in terms of Lipitor, it's actually made more than $130 billion to Pfizer, just this one drug, uh, since its launch in 1996. That's a lot of money. Uh, so what is in that little pill of Lipitor. And you'll find that most of it is most of it's actually things like chalk that we write uh, uh, with on a blackboard or things like cellulose that we make paper out of in addition to some emulsifiers and some thickeners. And this is, this is the major constituent or major constituents uh, uh, of a drug. And of course, these things, they do not have an effect on your body. They are innocuous. They, they, they don't exert uh, any biological type effect. But most importantly, naturally, it must have an active ingredient to treat that medication, except that there is only 10 milligrams of it. Now, given that a pill of Lipitor weighs around half a gram, actually just 2% of the entire tablet is the active ingredient that would treat uh, this uh, illness. And this is true of many modern, uh, modern medication. It's just an indication just how, how potent those active ingredients are and how little of it you need for a human body, which is, of course, uh, a lot larger than 10 milligrams. So what is the secret magic ingredient? So this is the active ingredient of Lipitor. Now, don't stress, it's an organic uh, uh, structure. You do not need to worry about it. It doesn't, uh, doesn't make any difference. 
uh, what it looks like or what it is. But there are two key important things about it. One of them I've already mentioned. The first thing is that it is an organic molecule, i.e. it has carbon atoms in it. And the second one is that it is a relatively small organic molecule. And whilst this is a particular example of Lipitor, actually most of the modern medications that we take today or the active ingredients of those tablets that we take today are small organic molecules. So where do they come from? So I've decided to illustrate this uh, as a rocket uh, and I'm going to launch a drug to market uh, through this rocket. Uh, and how does this process start? There are many different ways uh, in which a drug discovery uh, uh, program would commence, but I'll give you, say, one example. And that would be to identify a problem, which in this case would be identifying some kind of a disease. So we have a disease, and now we want to somehow go about developing a drug to treat that disease. Given that a, a, a good drug is likely to be a small organic molecule, you will be thinking, well, what kind of molecules could we be making in order to treat that illness? So you will go to, uh, to the blackboard and you will start looking at the various structures that you might be interested in, in making. And this is, of course, where organic synthesis comes in because you, somebody needs to make those molecules and it will be the organic chemist the, the synthetic chemists who will make those compounds. So that's fine. You go away to the lab, you make those compounds. What happens then? Then there are various uh, tests that you need to carry out. The first of which is biology. So you need to have some kind of very simple and flexible biological assay to, to test the compounds that you have made against to see are these molecules active against the disease that you're trying to treat, or are they not? You will also be interested uh, in this uh, concept known as pharmacokinetics, and really all this means is what does the body do to that drug once you have taken it? Does it excrete it within two minutes, which wouldn't be very good because the drug wouldn't have enough time to act on your body, or is it going to stay around in your body for days on end and start becoming toxic, right? You don't want that either. And finally, of course, you want to be seeing is the, are the molecules that you're making, do they have any side effects? They might be doing what you wanted to do, but of course they might be doing other things. So once you have made these molecules and tested, their activity and their toxicity, etc. you will look at the best candidates and you will think, right, it's active a little bit, it's toxic a little bit, well, how can we make this better? How can we optimize that molecule? How can we change its structure, optimize the structure in order to make it perhaps more potent and less toxic? That's where, again, organic synthesis comes in and you make another batch of molecules and you screen them against all of these things and the cycle is iterated many times until you are able to select the best potential drug. And so you're looking into making and screening of thousands of compounds to get to this point. You are likely to end up probably with around 20, around a dozen, generally on average. Of course, before you start thinking about, okay, well, let's start taking this drug, you need to carry out some very serious preclinical safety testing, uh, and that will be done in vivo, most likely on mice or rats, and you would do that on all of these 20 compounds, and you will probably choose only one, which will be the most active, most potent, it will have all the right properties, will not have the side effects, the rest of it. This is where your phase one, two, and three clinical trials begin. And these are now clinical trials on humans. And they're absolutely massive clinical trials. The higher the number, the bigger it is. But that means that the synthetic chemists need to start developing an industrial synthesis 
of that molecule, of that active ingredient, and the chances are you will need to be making kilograms and kilograms of it because you need to satisfy these clinical trials. There will be thousands of people taking part in that trial and you will need to be giving them bottles and bottles of those tablets. Even here, the attrition rate is around 90%, so even at this point, 90% of those molecules are likely to fail. They will not meet the safety and efficacy criteria that are required. And if you are lucky enough, this is when you will, your drug will get registered, you will start making it in some kind of a chemical plant, and this is how you will launch your drug into market. Key, of course, is that organic synthesis here is the fuel of this rocket, because without it, none of this would be happening. And really what this means is that you are making thousands of compounds, and if you didn't, you wouldn't have this program. It takes, on average, 10 to 12 years for a drug to be developed from conception of idea to launching it to the market. And for a big pharmaceutical company, this is likely to cost around five to $10 billion per drug launched. And that, that's a lot of money. So what is organic synthesis? So organic synthesis in simplistic terms is the construction of organic molecules via a simple sequence of reactions. So imagine this is our target organic molecule as drawn here. And these are chemical bonds and little motifs joined together. And you'd think that this is just a simple process of gathering it all together. And actually it is. So if you take two building blocks, A and B, you can mix them together, nothing will happen. But if you add a reagent, a very specific reagent that will be able to activate A and B, then you will be able to form a chemical bond between them, right? And this is how you have coupled the two little building blocks together. Likewise, if you then add building block C and another set of specific reagents that you'll be able to join B to C here. And again, if you add building block D and another set of specific reagents, then you will be forming a bond between B and D. And so in this case, essentially, what you have done is you have made your final organic target molecule in three discrete chemical steps, in three discrete chemical reactions. So what do we do, or what do I do in my research? We develop new chemical reactions. So we develop these discrete chemical steps to make organic synthesis easier. So if we look at one of those chemical steps in just a little bit more detail, again, we have two building blocks. We have A and B. You mix them together, but nothing will happen. If you add a specific reagent that will activate A and B, and you will be able to form your new coupled product, where now there is a chemical bond between A and B. But there is a problem here, because if you are, say, wanting to couple a thousand molecules of A and B, you will require a thousand molecules of this reagent, which will, of course, give you a thousand molecules of product, but very importantly, will also give you a thousand molecules of the spent reagent because it's already reacted, which means that you are generating chemical waste. You need to get rid of this. This is not desired. All you want is this, but you are generating the same amount of chemical waste. A much better process, and this is what we do in our research, is called catalysis. So I've put here that a catalyst is a molecule that accelerates a chemical reaction but remains unchanged at the end of it. I guess the most obvious example for many of you would be, say, a catalytic converter in your car, which oxidizes carbon monoxide 
and turns it into carbon dioxide. So it's a chemical reaction, how one gas turns into another, but the catalytic converter remains unchanged. However, without that catalytic converter, you would only have carbon monoxide coming out. So this is a very similar process. And what you need is instead of a reagent, you only need a small amount, a very small amount, of a metal catalyst, as shown here. And what it does is it allows for the two building blocks, A and B, to join to this metal catalyst to give you the structure as shown here. But the result of this is that A and B now become chemically activated. And when they become chemically activated, they can form a bond between them. So now we are forming this chemical bond between two building blocks, A and B. And what happens then is you can release the coupled A and B as the product and you regenerate your metal catalyst, which, as you can see, has remained unchanged. Once you have regenerated the metal catalyst, it can then move on to couple another set of A and B to give you the product and the cycle carries on and on and on. And what that means is that you therefore need only a very small amount of that catalyst for this reaction to work. So this is known as a catalytic cycle. Uh, we need a very small amount of the catalyst, which means that this process is likely to be a lot cheaper because we do not need all of that reagent as shown here. But it also means that it's a greener process because we are not generating chemical waste. What we're also interested in is to make slightly different molecules because this is a, just a slightly simplistic way of looking at it. So this is where I will just take a very quick diversion to explain a different concept to you. So if you take your left hand, hopefully you can see that if you put a mirror plane in here, that your right hand is the mirror image of your left hand, right? If this is a this is a mirror plane here. And if you take those two hands, they're actually non-superimposable. You can't superimpose those two hands, i.e. the two hands, I will just say they are different, okay? Organic molecules can also have mirror images. And when they have mirror images, they're likely to have different properties. For example, take limonene. This is the structure of limonene. Again, you do not need to worry about it. This is found uh, uh, in actually quite a lot of quantities of orange peel, and therefore, unsurprisingly, excuse me, <laughs> it smells of oranges. But the mirror image of this molecule, which is shown here, in fact, smells of lemon. It does not smell of oranges at all. So you may wonder, well, what has this got to do with drug molecules? Of course, there is a much uh, uh, sadder example, uh, and this is thalidomide. And many of you will, of course, know the thalidomide story. Uh, and this is, again, the structure of thalidomide. And this mirror image of the molecule is effective against morning sickness, exactly what uh, the drug was meant to be doing. But its mirror image as shown here, causes birth defects. And the sad story was that this drug was administered as a 50-50 mixture of the two. So whilst it was doing the right thing, it also caused birth defects. Uh, I've built these two models, which are the two mirror images. I can pass this on to you if you want to see whether they are superimposable, they shouldn't be. If you can work it out, then that's great. If you can't, I can always show you uh, after, this, after this talk. So really what this is saying is that being able to make just one mirror image of an organic molecule is very important. If you're making a mixture, you could end up in trouble. 
So how does this how does this then relate to what we do? So as I have said, we we develop new chemical reactions, and that metal catalyst that we're using is very specific. It is actually based on palladium metal. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to make just one mirror image of the molecule and not the other. So again, this is the catalytic cycle, except that I have now changed this from any metal catalyst to a palladium catalyst. And again, the two building blocks A and B bind to the catalyst like this. They get activated, which then allows that to form a chemical bond between A and B, and that gets released uh, as the product. Under normal conditions, you would also be making a mirror image of that molecule, of the bound molecule, as shown here. So this is the mirror plane. But what we are able to do is we are able to only generate this mirror image of the molecule and not that one. And this is to do with the structure of this palladium catalyst, and you can fine-tune it in certain ways in order to be able to control which of the two mirror images you are making. So, so how does this work relate to everything that I have been talking about? Where are we in the grand scheme of things? So, of course, I work in a university, so we are developing new catalysts, new chemical reactions, which means that we're generating new knowledge. And as far as us and our research uh, our community are concerned, is, is that we're most interested in, in, in broadening our knowledge and opening up new research avenues to advance the science that we do. But of course, this has major implications in industry. So for drug discovery, uh, uh, for the pharmaceutical industry in drug discovery, we can make molecules in more efficient ways. By the methods that we develop, those chemical reactions that we develop, we can make molecules that we have not been able to make before. And we can, of course, screen those molecules for biological activity that we want to have. And very importantly, we are able to access one mirror image and not the other. I've told you about catalysis, and catalysis becomes extremely important when we come to talking about large-scale drug synthesis, which we have to do for the clinical trials, and of course, most importantly, for making tons and tons of the active compound as you start selling that drug uh, in the form of a tablet. And because you can use a catalyst, those processes become less expensive, and because you're not generating chemical waste, they're likely to be greener uh, uh, and more sustainable. But more importantly, this has a uh, major implication on us because that means that we have access to new uh, or improved medicines. That means that we are improving our quality of life. We're likely to be living longer. And the healthier we are, uh, uh, the more we can work the more we can build uh, a, a richer society. So in summary, just as a reminder, uh, trying to convince you that many of the drugs that you take today are just small organic molecules. And this is the major ingredient, uh, or the, the minor most important ingredient of a tablet. Uh, that drug discovery and development is actually a very long process, but more importantly, it's a very expensive uh, uh, process. And that without organic synthesis, without people who are able to make molecules, that wouldn't be happening. Uh, we also talked about catalysis, which is a much more efficient uh, uh, approach to doing synthesis to traditional methods. We have talked about how catalysis can enable us to make one mirror image uh, of a molecule and not the other. And I very briefly touch how our work focuses on palladium catalysis specifically and how we are able to develop new chemical reactions 
to, to, to join up different types of molecules together, again, to be able to make one mirror image and not the other. Uh, very importantly, it wasn't just me, of course, who did all this work. I'd like to thank my students, past and present. That's Stephen, uh, Paula, Miles, Nifa, Dunia, Sibrin, uh, and Nick. Uh, and this work has been funded by uh, the European, <laughs> European, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, the EU, Lancaster University, the Nuffield Foundation, and the University of York. And I thank you for your attention. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> as Nick said, I'm um, a lecturer at the, uh, in the engineering department at Lancaster, but I'm actually a, a chemist who's, who's masquerading as an engineer. Um, and I've been masquerading for some time now, but they've not noticed, so I'm okay. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is what the, the work that we've been doing um, to kind of identify the sort of the metals in the, uh, in, in the nuclear waste and, and the way that we do that. So to start off, I'm going to just say a little bit about what happens to, um, to nuclear fuel when it comes out of the reactor. Um, the, the first thing that happens really is that, or the, the first thing to recognise is that there is, within uh, spent nuclear fuel, there is still quite a bit of uranium le left over. And it's quite an important resource, and it's quite important for us to be able to, to reuse that resource. Um, and so one of the things that we, that we first do is just dissolve the whole thing, and then we want to separate the uranium that we want to recycle and reuse from things like the plutonium, the neptunium, and the, and the fission products, which are going to be treated either as waste or as a resource in a, in a different area. So, for example, the, uh, the uranium will be recycled, but the plutonium will be uh, sent away and turned into some kind of nuclear deterrent. And the neptunium and the fission products will be trapped in a, a, a glass and sent off for uh, waste storage, because that's, that's what it is, it's just waste. Part of, and then there's a, there's a, there's a, a slightly more advanced slide where, the, where you, um, you purify uranium and the, and the plutonium because you're, you're actually interested in doing something with those. Um, it's quite a complex process, at least by the number of steps that it involves. And uh, one of the things that we're quite interested in, in figuring out is whether we've got what we say we've got. So it's all well and good saying that we're going to be separating uranium from the plutonium from the neptunium, but it's actually better to say, well, we are separating the uranium and I can prove it. And the way that we do this is generally by using some kind of um, uh, analysis techniques such as uh, scintillation counting or um, ICPMS. And these are techniques that work very well, but they're quite heavy. They, they require heavy equipment, they're time consuming, there's a lot of sample prep to do. Uh, and frankly, if you want to take them into the field, that's not really uh, going to be something that you can do. What we, what, we do, what we do as sensor developers is to try and figure out a way that we can exploit the material that we're really after quantifying uh, and, and, and its properties in order to, uh, to identify it and quantify it. And so what we're here to talk about today is metals. And this is the uh, periodic table. Many of you will, I'm sure, be uh, familiar with it already. And most of these are metals. Most of these are metals, and we're actually quite interested in the properties of those, um, especially the transition metal, which is the, the yellow block in the middle, and, um, and the, the actinides and lanthanides at, at the bottom, the, uh, the purple rows. These are the ones that we're really interested in. And we're interested in them because they've got some very particular um, properties that we can exploit uh, in order to, de to, to detect them. It's actually all a lie. We're not really interested in metals at all. Um, what we're really interested in is electrons. So an atom is made up of protons and neutrons in the centre, the, the, the blue and black balls on the, on the slide there, and they form the nucleus. And flying around that, we've got electrons. And if we take electrons away, or if we, if we add electrons to, a, um, to, a, um, to, to an atom, we either oxidise or reduce them. And the kind of things that we do with oxidation and reduction is things like this. 
the carbon in the, in the wood on the bonfire is being, uh, is being oxidized, whilst the oxygen in the air that's providing the, um, the, 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 the other half of that reaction uh, is being reduced. Or the uh, iron in um, steel corrodes away. And that's also an oxidation reaction. The iron is being oxidized and the, uh, the oxygen of the air is being reduced. But we can actually exploit those pro uh, oxidation and reduction processes to do something useful. Um, so, for example, we've got these um, lovely highly colored uh, aluminum bottles there. And the surface finish that they've, that they've got is an, an anodization process, which is really an oxidation process, just another word for, for the same thing. And that forms on the outside of the aluminium, it forms a, um, a, 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 an oxide layer, which can be treated as some dyes to make it look pretty. But also, and most importantly, protects the, uh, the, the, the aluminium from being further corroded. So it provides a protective layer. And of course, redox processes are, are, are also very, very useful in um, energy storage, things like batteries, where the chemical, the, the, the chemical uh, potential energy, the electrochemical potential energy is being transferred into a, uh, an electrical current. And it's that current, really, that we're, that we're going to be exploiting uh, when we make electrochemical sensors. And I'll say a little bit about that, uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but I want to come back to those electrons, because they do, they do something else as well. So the electrons around an atom are in quantized levels. That means, technical term, that means they're present only in a set of energy levels. They can't be found in between those energy levels. They've got to be found at those precise, precise energy levels. But we can do something. We can tickle them with a little bit of energy and promote them from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. Now, if we do that, they absorb some of, the, some of that energy. And we'll come back to that term of absorbance in a minute. But they also become in an excited state what we call it. And that excited state means that the electrons are more available to do some useful things, uh, useful chemical reactions. So if we shine light, and I've let the cat out of the bag there, one of the ways that we can do that is actually to shine light on it because the, the, the range of energy um, differences between sort of our ground state and our excited state is actually... Um, corresponds to visible light. Well, visible light and a little bit of higher energy into the UV and a little bit of lower energy into the infrared. But generally, visible light will, be, it will carry the sufficient energy to, um, to, to uh, promote those electrons to higher energy levels. And so we, we've designed a, a sensor that will take advantage of both of those processes. And that sensor is the micro-optical ring electrode. So it's an electrode. It will be able to pick up a current. It will be able to deliver or quantify the amount of electrons that are being exchanged. Okay. But also it's built around this fiber optic here. And if I can... No, I can't point, I can't point to this. Oh, there's a pointer here. Is that the one? So we've got a fiber optic here running down the center of the, um, the, center of the probe. And it's coated in a layer of gold here, this, this yellow layer. And so we can shine light from somewhere around this, this end of the slide here, <laughs> which will travel all the way down to whatever we're trying to quantify and hopefully promote those electrons and we'll be able to pick them up using, uh, using this, uh, this electrode here. And we'll be able to measure that current and that current will tell us something about what's going on in, in the solution that that electrode is dipped in. So we designed the, um, the, the, the sensor and we wanted to just test it, test it out. So to do that, we used a model system. And our model system is ruthenium and is made up of a ruthenium trees by pyridyl compound, which I've not given the, um, the, the, the structure because it, it's pretty irrelevant of how it looks really. But this is something that is brightly 
orange in, in colour, and so it will absorb a lot of green light, around about 460 nanometers. And um, it's, it's present in the, in the um, in, it, 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 it's used in the presence of the uh, iron system. And I'll, I'll show you exactly why in a second. But if we were to have this solution containing the ruthenium uh, species and the iron species and measure the current that's, uh, that, that's resulting at the electrode surface from a set of voltages, then we'd see the reduction of iron here at the bottom and the oxidation of the ruthenium. And that's in the dark. Nothing's happened yet. This is my sort of baseline response. If I shine light into the system, the energy is absorbed by the ruthenium, and it gives me this ruthenium star species here. And that's the photo excited. That's the, the electron is in a, in a, higher, in a higher state of, of excitement. And what that means is that it makes it more available for a redox reaction to take place. And our redox reaction will happen between the ruthenium species and the iron species. If I didn't have the iron here, then the likely thing that would happen is that the ruthenium would just relax back to its ground state, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do anything useful with it. As it is, I've got the iron, and I reduce my iron to iron 2, and I oxidize my ruthenium 2 to ruthenium 3. And it's that more stable ruthenium species that I'm going to be able to pick up at the electrode. And so what happens is that by switching the light on, I've gone from a system that contains the ruthenium 2 species and the iron 3 to a system that contains the ruthenium 2, the iron 3, the ruthenium 3, and the iron 2. And so I'll be able to see this reduction process here and this oxidation process here. But a key thing here is this section of, um, of, of voltage window between roughly 0.5 and, and 1 volt. Because if, if I stand here, if I apply 2 volts my, uh, on my electrode and keep switching the light on and off, what I should see is a jump from this blue line here down to this red line there. I switch the light off again, should jump back, back up to the, to the blue line. So, there's only one thing to do, right? Test it out. And so this is what we get. Light off, turn the light on, you get this decrease and then we reach a plateau. Turn the light off again, you get the increase and you get another plateau. Now, two things to notice about this. My light off um, signal is round about the same, the, same, the same value every time. And the light on is also around about the same value all the time. So I've got a sensor now that is actually reproducible. It can actually measure the, uh, the, the, the photocurrent that results from a, a set of photochemical reactions and give me some information. What information? Well, that's the million dollar questions, right? So we did a bit of maths. <laughs> okay. And we... We determined that the photocurrent was given by this monstrosity there. Now, I don't want you to focus on that bit there yet, because, well, or, or, or at all, <laughs> frankly, because that's the time-dependent response, and I don't want to talk about that today. What I want to talk about is the fact that this photocurrent here is, um, is dependent on this S species, which in actual fact is my ruthenium species, and this A species here, which in actual fact is my iron species. It's also dependent on a whole lot of things, like um, the, a property that's down to the uh, absorbance, the, the amount of light that's, that's being absorbed by my, uh, by my sensitizer, by my, by my ruthenium. It's also dependent on the size of the ring electrode. It's dependent on the amount of light that's going, in, going into the system. But these aren't really important because they're set. Okay, so we can quantify them and we can move on. The important thing is this S and this A here, which figures twice. So if I was to measure the photocurrent as a function of concentration of ruthenium, I should get a straight line. I is 
equal to some constant times s. Okay? So I measured the photocurrent as a function of concentration of ruthenium, and it's great. We've got a straight line. So we're happy with that. We've got a sensor that measures something, and we can relate that something to the actual concentration of the sensitizer. We also want to relate that to the concentration of iron now. That, that relationship with the iron isn't quite as straightforward as the photocurrent is directly proportional to, uh, to the iron. And in fact, we can see that it's not, it, we, don't, we don't get a straight line from that. But that's okay, we don't expect one. However, we're scientists and we quite like straight lines because they make our lives quite a lot easier. And there's something that we can do here to actually obtain something that would be, that would be a straight line. And it's quite literally taking this, this equation and putting it on its head. 1 over the photocurrent is equal to something times 1 over the concentration of iron here. So if we plot 1 over the photocurrent as a function of 1 over the concentration of iron, we should get a straight line. And we do. So we're quite, quite happy with that. Again, we've got a sensor that measures something, and we, we now get a handle on what that something means in terms of what we've got in our, in our solution. The other thing is, because the electrons will require a certain amount of energy in a given molecule to be promoted to an excited state, it would be quite useful if we could exploit that in order to... Um, to, to, to be able to separate the signals from, say, uranium and plutonium, or uranium and neptunium, so that we can use one tool to monitor a whole, a whole host of, um, of analytes. And so what we did was to measure the photocurrent that is produced at the micro-optical ring electrode as a function of the well, the quality of the light, the colour of the light that we, that we shine down the fibre optic. And what we found for the ruthenium ion species is that that trace, which is the, the blue dots here, that's the photocurrents as a function of wavelength, that actually follows quite closely the, absorb, the, the absorbance trace of the ruthenium species. It follows it quite closely, but it's not, it's not an exact match. Uh, we get the maximum value around about the maximum value, the maximum value of the photocurrent around about the maximum value of the, uh, of the amount of light that's being absorbed, which we would expect. But there is a deviation at the end there. And without saying too much, that's to do with the way that the electrons need to be in the right amount of spin in order for the, um, for the uh, reaction with the ion to take place. And if you're interested in that, I can talk to you about that a little bit later. But that's the, that's the, the reason for this, uh, for this separation between the two traces, is that there is, there is a mechanism uh, issue behind it. Okay, so coming back to my earlier slide, how are we going to be exploiting that in order to uh, determine the concentrations of uranium, plutonium and neptunium in our various feeds? Well, the key really is looking at the absorbance of, uh, of those species in, in water. And what we've got here is um, plutonium and, um, sorry, neptunium in the, in the green here, which absorbs quite a lot of light in the infrared, in the near infrared, and quite a bit in the sort of, so, sort of reds of the, uh, of the visible spectrum. While the plutonium has got a big absorption peak here, in the sort of um, bluey greens. And then another type of plutonium will absorb somewhere in the middle there. And so if we tune the wavelength of the, um, of the light that we shine down the fibre optic, we should be able to, to determine each of those individually using just one tool. And that's really where the story ends. Well, it doesn't end quite. Because we've got a PhD student, Gary, who's sat in the audience, who's going to be taking this idea and proving that this, that the, the, this is what we can do. Um, the work that he's going to be doing is, is sponsored by uh, the EPSRC 
through the next generation nuclear uh, center for total training. And it's half funded by the EPSRC and half funded by Sellafield. Of course, any work like this doesn't, uh, doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. And so I'd like to thank all of these people who helped along the way at some point or another.